Good morning, Middletown. Happy Sabbath, I want to say, of course, but you know what I want to say more than that? Spring has sprung. Do you say that? Spring has sprung. And yet, I was really surprised this morning when I got an alert on my phone, and it said, special weather statement. Yes. And it says, we will have below normal temperatures. And this is going to come behind a cold front. And it's saying it's going to freeze out all the plants that have responded to the warmth that we've had before. And then it says, the hard freeze will damage, kill, and stunt the growth of these plants. If you have agricultural interests, take measures to protect your plants. Well. I don't care, spring has sprung, and I am looking forward to gardening. Are there any gardeners here? How many of you dabble? Our son says, play in the dirt. You don't have to be a farmer, but you, you grow something, something. I thought I'd see more hands here, what's going on? Yes, I see some back there. You don't want to claim it, but last year, we did something that we had not done in a long, I mean decades, not just a long time, decades. We planted tomatoes. That's gardening. Somebody said that wasn't much. I see you. But we planted tomatoes, and our daughter-in-law suggested to keep the animals and things off of them that we should plant sweet basil in and around them. So we did that. And then we in Kentucky, of course, so we planted mint. And I was so proud. We had the best mint, the best basil for cooking and for salads, and the most delicious tomatoes. And then on top of that, um, I like to put in the ground, you know, the perennials, so that they will come back each year. That's kind of the easiest gardening. So we have some of those out. I'm just praying for them. I'm not going out with blankets and heaters and things tonight. Surely they'll be okay. And then the other thing, we plant annuals as well. So we planted these annuals and put them on the porch, and they were beautiful. But I just can't stand to see them die when fall comes. So I gather them all up like little babies, and I bring them into the house to my husband's great delight. <laughs> and we nurse them through the winter. And most of them have made it. We've lost only one, but everything else is made. So we're waiting just for that right moment when we can take them back out onto the porch and let them flourish again when those perennials are really up in full strength. And then we did something else last year that really made us feel good. This is something I had not done for many more decades. When with my expert, my great-grandmother, we would always plant annuals from seeds. Do you use seeds anymore? We would plant from seeds and then watch the little sprouts and this nourish them. Well, we tried this last year. We had about five or six packets of seeds that we'd gotten from some charity to which we had contributed. And, oh, there were all kinds and uh, all kinds of beautiful flowers, I should say. And so we went around trying to find the right spot and we scratched the surface, you know, put the seeds in, covered them, some a little deeper, some not so deep, and did what we were supposed to do. But only one set of seeds sprouted and grew. These were zinnias. Do you like zinnias? They started off, you know, the little tiny things, and I was leaping for joy when I saw them pop up. But then they kept growing and growing. And finally, they were this high, and they had big, beautiful blossoms. And they attracted a hummingbird that came to our house every day. So I'm looking forward to doing that again. So with all of this, and I'm sure this is what brought it on, but the Holy Spirit guided me to our topic today, which deals with seeds. 
the parable of the sower. And then I came to church. I just have to insert this. I came to church this morning, and Melvin, I was heading back to Sabbath school, and then I said, well, I need to visit the other class because we never go there. And so I asked Tracy, what are you studying? And she said, we're reading through the Gospels. And then something clicked in my head. I said, where are you? Can you imagine? The parable of the sowers. <laughs> so we had a good laugh. But we hope that there's more in here and that the Holy Spirit will guide us. Let's pray. Our Father, our God, we thank you for this beautiful spring day. Yes, it's cold, but the sun is shining. And we are feeling like we are ready to grow something. So we pray, Father, that you will speak to us. Holy Spirit, fill us this morning in Jesus' name. We're going to move right through this because this is a familiar parable to all of us. And I would um, first point out, you know that this parable is, form, is found in all three of the first three Gospels, I should say. Uh, so Matthew has a version, and they're all pretty much the same, but as we noted even this morning, that there are some very special differences in the way that these are presented. And we know part of this is because of the mindset of the writer, the background of the writer, the context of the writer. So the focus in some cases has to do with the writer's perspective. But Jesus' message still comes through in each one. We know that it's Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. And I'm going to be reading from Luke 8, beginning at verse 4. So it's after this, Jesus had been doing some things, but then after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12, the disciples, were with him. And also, and I want to emphasize this because you know that March is what? March. Women's <laughs> history. Month, Women's History Month. I'm not sure about that, but okay. But women, we were there even then. That's the point. There's some women's history in this. And so um, verse 3 says, And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. And I'm going to jump just a little bit. And it says, These women were helping to support Jesus and the disciples out of their own means. That's important for us to know, especially for little girls to know that. But we move on. That's not what we're talking about this morning. Verse 4 says, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. And here we go. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out. It's like Jesus was speaking, and then he paused and just belted out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And then, you know the, the story of the disciples. You know how they had been brought along bit by bit. Jesus was teaching them by example, by model, by preaching and teaching. But the disciples still did not understand everything that Jesus wanted them to get. They were still growing, just as most of us still are, right? As long as we're alive. So the, the Bible says his disciples asked him what this parable meant. So Jesus, in verse 11, says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. 
And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. But they have no root. They believe for a while. But in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. That's kind of everything of life. And they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. We know this is a parable. We know that parables are metaphors, comparisons, used to illustrate a greater point. One commentator says, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The original language word for parable means to cast or to throw alongside. A parable is a story that teaches something new by putting it alongside something familiar. My husband just normally does that. We're talking and sometimes I don't want to stop and I'm going on and on about something and he says, wait, wait, uh, this that you're talking about is like that. Now when we say like, it's simile, but still, it's a comparison, right? He, he just naturally, in the way he processes, attaches what is already there to something new or puts that something new into what is already there. And there's psychological terms for that and we don't have time to get into the brain science, but it's the best way to do this. So Jesus, who knows all things, is using this parable, as we say, to teach a heavenly message with the familiar things of earth. Jesus used a scene that was familiar to those who were hearing him. Ellen White paints a beautiful picture in Christ's Object Lessons, I believe page 34. She says, a sore walking back and forth on a field scattering seed was a common sight at that time. And she says, even as Jesus was sitting there speaking and teaching, and the people were sitting listening, they could just look up on the hillside. They could look up and see the farmers walking back and forth between the garden plots casting out seeds, sowing seeds. She says uh, they could uh, be seen scattering seed into the rich soil of the plain of Gennesaret as it sweeps up from the blue waters of Galilee to the foothills. Can't you just see it, the way she wrote that? They can understand that like the seed, the word has life and power within it. Seeds have natural germinating ability. So it is with God's word. Jesus says, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6. Whoever receives the word by faith is receiving the very life and character of God. But Jesus shows that a seed can do nothing until it is planted. Remember that familiar verse of John 12, verily I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat, a seed, falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. This that we've read is the parable of the sower, but we are actually focusing on the soil. Jesus described four different kinds of soil, that is different human hearts, types of human hearts. And when we say heart, what are we talking about? The mind, right? The mind, really. So first, the hard soil in verses five and 12. 
there were plants that, or there were paths, let me go back, that ran through these gardens, these fields. The way they did it to stay safe, uh, farmers would gather in small villages and right outside where their, their homes were, were these fields and they would get up in the mornings and go out together to plant or to work their fields. Now, you know, especially those of us who live in the city, we could be familiar with what? Garden plots? You know, sometimes in the, in the city, in a park or in an open area, in a lot, there's a, just a, a big open area where all the people in the neighborhood can come and plant their gardens. But then we divide them up, right, into plots. So my plot might be right here and yours is right beside mine and then there's another. But as we plant our seed, we're walking between these plots and planting the seeds on our soil but some of them fall on the hard path where we've been walking. And that's what Jesus is showing here. This foot traffic between the plots has hardened the soil. The seed was scattered on it, but it could not penetrate the deep, the deep, deeply dense soil. The seed just laid on top of the soil, exposed to the elements and everything. And in the parable, the wild birds that could always be seen at planting time come in and they just eat up the seed. You know how it is when you plant new grass seed in your yard? It's like birds get the memo from miles around and they all come and converge on your yard and eat up your grass seed. So that's what's happening here. And it's interesting. We're talking about these wild birds eating up the seed. Matthew says that these birds represent, quote, the wicked one in verse... 19, 13, 19. And then um, going, and then in the NIV, it's called the evil one. Mark says it's Satan, just puts it right out there. And Luke, in both versions, says it's the devil. So we see what's happening here. Now we go on and look, the shallow soil, shallow soil, it's not deep, it's shallow surface. This is ground with a rock layer, just hard rock. In Kentucky, when you want to build a house, sometimes you run into that, right? Or even just when you want to plant your garden, you go out and start digging in your backyard, and the first thing, you hit rock. There's a solid layer of rock, and this is what it's talking about in this type of soil. It's just a thin layer over the rock. So as the sun bears down on this rock, on this soil and the rock, the rock intensifies and reflects the heat back from the sun. Well, at first you might think that's a good thing because it causes the seed to germinate quickly. But then there is no deepness of earth, no depth, no place for the plant to send down roots to gather moisture for life. So the plant cannot grow. It starts up, it shoots up, but nothing nourishes it. And the sun bears down on it. The seed can germinate, but the shoot cannot send the roots down. The sun bears down on it and quickly it dies. It just withers away. And then the third kind of soil, the crowded soil or thorny soil, it is said in some places. Here, there is enough soil so the roots can grow down, but there's not enough space or room for the plants to grow up to maturity. They can't produce fruit. I read somewhere, probably on my phone, you know, we get these news alerts sometimes, and some of them are interesting. I read about a man in Florida who had refused to sell his property to big time developers. And that caught my eye because that happened right here in Louisville as well, down on West Broadway, about 17th or 18th Street. Uh, some of the big factories or big developers wanted to buy those little houses that were along there so that they could build whatever. And one family just refused to sell. So one by one, the houses were torn down and big buildings were going up. And finally, there's this one 
house with all these big buildings all around it. This is what happened in Florida. But what caught my attention, besides that being a little bit humorous, the man had beautiful gardens. But because these tall structures were towering over everything, the sun could not really get through. And he said, his plants began to die. His mango tree was still standing, but stopped producing fruit. So this is the way it is. You know, in your garden, it is as though you give license to weeds first. No matter what, the weeds will grow, and they grow so fast. We went out the other day, and we saw just little peaks of weeds coming. I call them wild flowers, of course, but they were trying to come up. And I thought, maybe we could just leave them, because they're going to be pretty with the others. But in a day or two, they had just taken over. Weeds will just blot out, choke out the good plants. And so that's what was happening with this soil. And the word thorn or briar is used in, in some of the versions here. And according to what we understand with the original language, it just means any kind of prickly plant. You know, it's difficult to grow vegetables, or flowers, anything that you want, in the presence of these weeds. Then we move on quickly to the good soil. Good soil is soft, fertile, loamy, some say, crumbly, balanced, healthy soil. It is free of rocks, free of decay, free of weeds, and free of pests. It readily receives and supports germination and plant growth. It nurtures seeds and plants through to maturity for a good harvest. Now typically, and I smiled this morning because this is the way we always interpret this passage. The types of soil in this parable are said to represent the different types of people we encounter, encounter as we go out to share the gospel, right? Well, I want to give you a different twist on that. Maybe there's another meaning. And just because I don't trust Simmons, I checked some good theologians, good Seventh-day Adventist Christian theologians. I know I have to say that whole thing. <laughs> the parable here also illustrates the mixed character of those in the church. Should I say that again? <laughs> the parable also it does the other, but also illustrates the mixed character of those of us in the church. And this is where we will focus just for a few minutes and we're finished. So when a person hears and understands the word, the seed is planted in the heart or the mind. You know, sometimes we'll say, let me plant this thought in your mind. Do you ever say this? Let me plant this thought in your head. Well, that's what we're talking about. So if prepared, the human heart or mind can receive the seed of the word and produce a harvest. And I'm going to repeat that over and over again because that's where God wants us to be. This harvest is spiritual fruit. If you study these passages, you have to come to the conclusion that what it's talking about is spiritual fruit in the context of our message today. We often then equate the fruit, as I said, to converts. But this is showing us something else. Converts are important. We're supposed to share the gospel and bring others in. No problem with that. But we're focusing today on character within each of us. So when fruit is used here, it's about the fruit of the spirit. 
Now, I have to say, we're talking about what the Holy Spirit gives us, the fruit of the Spirit. The, now, it's not the only thing that the Holy Spirit gives. For example, in Acts 1.8, you see that the Holy Spirit gives power. And then in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, there's a whole list. Remember, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and all of these kinds of things. The Holy Spirit gives these. But it is dangerous for us to receive power or even these special gifts if we don't have the character that is summarized in the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit. How, are there any primary Sabbath school kids in here? Primary level? Are there any juniors? Let me see. Are there any juniors? Thank you. Miss Wanda would just fall off her chair if she thought you hadn't graduated and gone on to the, to the other levels. Well, I want, you to, I want you to do something. I want you to say with me the fruits of the Spirit out loud. I know your parents told you to be quiet in church, but this one time, say it loud. Okay, you know the fruits of the Spirit? What's the first one? I hear you. Wonderful. Love. So let's say together. Love, joy, peace, patience or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. The early teens have it. Yes. <laughs> and self-control. That's kind of the summary of all that there should be to the Christian character. It's a summary. It doesn't break it all down. But if you really study each of those, you can't get around anything that God would have us to develop in our lives. That's found, of course, Galatians 5.22. And I heard this somewhere, and, and then the Holy Spirit literally tested me. And I, I tried to cheat by asking Nord, and he said, you should know this, or something like that. Somebody said that the first three of these, love, joy, and peace, are given to us by God. Just directly, God gives these to us. Right? Right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, George. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next three, let's see, love, joy, peace. And the next three, patience, kindness, and goodness are what we should give to others. And then the final three, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are our sacrificial offerings back to God. You have to study that. There's more to it, but I remembered part, part of that, and I like that. It's like the Ten Commandments. Remember the first four, our relationship with God, and then the other six, our relationship with other people. But I, I like that. It is important that we remember, yes, it's the parable of the sower, Jesus, it is, of course. And it talks a lot about the seed, but it's really about the soil for our understanding of what Jesus is teaching us. The important point is that the fruits of the Spirit are the result of the softening presence of the Holy Spirit on the human heart. So then let's look more closely at the four types of soil. The hard soil. Again, verse, uh, verses 5 and 12. This, this soil represents those who are insincere or superficial hearers of the word. They choose not to understand. It's not that they can't. But they choose not to understand. The biblical concept of understanding goes beyond just um, a mental comprehension. It includes a volitional decision, a willful decision. They hear the word but do not absorb it and immediately allow the enemy to snatch it away. A Chinese proverb says, when they hear the word, it enters the east ear, 
only to leave immediately by the west ear. <laughs> My great-grandmother used to say, it goes in one ear and comes out the other. Amen. They're not even trying. So be careful who you allow to trample on your heart. Then the rocky, shallow soil, verses 6 and 13. This soil illustrates those who hear and quickly respond to the message joyfully, but then quickly lose interest. This includes those in the fellowship of the church. Sometimes they are called nominal Christians or cultural Adventists. They're not deep. They're just not deep in their thinking, in their living, in their being. They have been in the church for many decades, but are shallow regarding spiritual matters. The heat of persecution can deepen the roots of a true Christian, but it exposes the shallowness of a false Christian. The parable says they germinated rapidly and withered away rapidly. We might say that the truly committed, and this is from a commentator, pay their dues up front, but shallow, marginally committed Christians cancel their membership when payment comes due. The rock of selfishness, Ellen White says again in Christ's Object Lessons, prevents the gospel from achieving reform in the life. No change. Any effort to serve Christ is so hindered by the fundamental purpose in life, she says, to serve self that the gospel has little or no influence. And then the crowded or thorny soil in verses 7 and 14. This soil illustrates the person who does not weed out things that stunt growth. Thorny ground hearers progress beyond the experience of the stony ground hearers, but they do not go on to perfection. And the way the word perfection is used, it's talking about maturation ripening. Therefore, let us, the writer of Hebrews said, move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. The parable says these seeds fell among thorns. Luke defines thorns as the worries, riches, and pleasures of this life. They are like weeds in a garden that overshadow and overpower the plants to keep them from growing, from maturing, and being fruitful. They are, these people are absorbed by the interests of the world. They live to pursue the world's attractions. They fail to weed out tendencies and traits that choke out their spiritual growth. The influence with, which draws this person away from spiritual things is not persecution that drives them out. No, it's, she says, competing gods. The cares of this life and the deceitfulness of its pleasures, they are lured away. Many of the things that attract the thorny ground hearers and absorb their attention are not bad or harmful in and of themselves, but they are so absorbed in this world and these things that they have no time to prepare for the next heaven to come. Spiritual life is relegated to a position of being only one interest among many, job, friends, social life, school, whatever. Thorny ground here is fall short of moral transformation, Ellen White says, again in Christ's Object Lessons. They want justification. I got saved. They want justification without sanctification. And then there's the good soil. This soil illustrates those who hear the word, understand the word, receive the word within, and patiently hang on and produce fruit from the word. 
Paul says to uh, the hearers in Thessalonica, when you receive the word of God, you received it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. And then Peter says, 1 Peter 1, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people, every one of us, all people are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. In Neruda's poem, I don't have it memorized, but he talks about all the things that winter, you know, the, the weather alert, all the things that winter does to the plants. It just wreaks havoc. But he, but he says, winter cannot prevent the spring. Praise God. No matter what happens, God is still in control. And Satan and all of his imps cannot prevent him from doing that good thing in us. Amen. Only we can prevent it. This soil produces the fruit of character that we said. The fruit of the spirit has to be revealed in the life. It includes winning others to Christ. Yes, Romans 1. It also includes Romans 15, money given to God's work. It also includes good works, Colossians 1. And Christian character, that's the fruits of the Spirit. And praise to the Lord, Hebrews 13. Just to illustrate a few. Note that good Soil or ground does not mean that any human heart is naturally good. No, not one. Romans, Paul says to the Romans, chapter 7, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. And then to the Philippians, For it is God who works in you to will just to want to and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The soil is good only as it yields to the plow work of the word of God and the softening influence of the Holy Spirit. So let's wrap it up. The parable of the sower, yes, is found in the first three Gospels. It was so important that it needed to be repeated three times. And we know how important three is in Scripture and in what God does. He gives it to us. And then again, and then again to make sure that we get it. In each of these, there is an admonition to hear, hear. We find the word here 19 times in Matthew 13, for example. We don't have time to go into all of the rest of that, but it is important that we hear God's word because, what does the word say, Romans 10? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus says, whoever, anybody, all of us, whoever has ears, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear, Mark says. And then Luke says, consider carefully how you hear. No, how you listen. It's here, but the word really is talking about listening. Cons be careful about how you listen. Is it with a receptive ear? Or a hard ear that pushes. You see what, what he's saying there. Jesus explained that everyone has a choice. Whether they will hear God's word with an open, responsive heart for understanding or not. The parable begins with the preaching of the word. The planting of the seed in the heart. According to Hebrews 4, the seed 
is alive and active. But the mind has to be receptive to it. The heart has to receive it. We have to allow the word of God to take root in the heart, be cultivated and nourished to bear fruit. Remember, fruit is the measure of true salvation. Amen. No fruit. Hmm. We used to say, what, there'll be no starless crowns or something like that. But we can't even get to the crown until it gets right in here. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to be perfect before we try to win others. Don't misunderstand me. But we have to be growing all along the way. The word says all of this character includes in Romans 6 holiness. And Christian character, that's really what's summarized in the fruits of the Spirit. Good works, Colossians 1. Winning others, again, Romans 1. Sharing what we have, Romans 15. And praising God, Hebrews 13. I just want to reiterate that. Jesus says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. He says, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Hmm, but a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. There was no reception in the hearts of the wayside hearers. The stormy, shallow ground hearers experienced only a momentary impulse. The crowded or thorny ground hearers began well, then choked out. But in the hearts of the good ground hearers, the response was permanent and effective. Notice, three-fourths of the soils did not bear fruit. 75% to whom Jesus had come. Jesus is saying, there's going to be a time in which the word will be rejected, even in the church. We'll be here but without the word. We can be deceived to think we are innately good. Like the Laodiceans who think they were rich and in need of nothing, the human heart has an amazing capacity to convince itself of falsehood. We are capable of lying to ourselves and then believing our own lies. The heart excuse me, the heart, scripture says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. A parable starts off as a picture that is familiar to the listeners. But as you carefully consider the picture, it becomes a mirror in which you see yourself. Then, if you see yourself, if we see ourselves as needy sinners and ask for help, the mirror becomes a window through which we can see God and his grace. To understand the parable and benefit from it demands that we are honest and humble. They say January is for new beginnings, perhaps. But I see spring as the time for the newness of life. It's time to plant, brothers and sisters, time to plant and cultivate. Is your soil ready to receive and nurture the seed? Ellen White says in Desire of Ages 348, the soil that responds to the grace of God shall be like a watered garden, and the glory of the Lord 
shall be seen upon him. Amen. Amen.